Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Selfish Podcast. Today, we have Simon Rinney, who I'm excited to share and get to know myself, as well as let the audience in on what he does as a, most of all, father, bloke, and social worker, and many other things. And we're going to find out about his passion, his life, and his journey. So welcome, Simon. Can you just share with myself and the audience, where in the world are you? Yeah, g'day, Luke. Uh, it's Simon Rooney here. Um, yeah, I'm coming at you from Queensland, Sunshine Coast in Australia. Oh, nice. It's just getting into winter here. So I imagine you've got, you're got you going into summer? Yeah, yeah. So it's um, spring now and it's getting starting to get wet. Like between now and Christmas gets really wet. Um, so we've already seen floods in, say, Victoria, New South Wales, top of Tassie. Um, and I think there's some more bad weather coming our way. But but yeah, springtime, um, very wet, and then yeah, we'll be coming into summer soon enough. So um, we've already hit the beach twice, so it's it's getting into that nice weather where we can do that. So oh, nice. Well, it's beautiful we can connect in this instant moment around the world. I'm mm. in a Europe in Spain from the UK, so my cool. isn't Spanish, <laughs> but yeah, and we're just going into winter, so it's uh, getting wet here too, but getting colder as well. Yeah, <laughs> with the opposite, getting wet but warmer. <laughs> What I like to do with my guests, so I get to know them more personally, is go back just a little bit. So can you paint me a picture? What was life like for you, say, pre-10 years old? Where did you grow up? How was school? Mm -hmm. What was life like? Yeah, so I grew up in a place called Adelaide, so South Australia. Um, so definitely not Queensland. It's a very different part of the world. And, and the northern suburbs is very working class um, type of environment. Um, lots of trades, lots of manufacturing. Um, you know, my mum was a cleaner. Dad worked at the local council. And, yeah, this is in the 80s and 90s. So, you know, the world around me was was influenced by, you know, my dad and my three brothers. Um, I played Australian rules football growing up, a very sports-orientated household, very masculine, testosterone-driven household. Um, sorry, mum, if you're listening. <laughs> Um, and, and yeah, up until about eight years old, I was pretty happy go lucky kid. Um, nothing really phased me. I was pretty, pretty much indestructible. Um, but then at eight years old, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the 10 age bracket because around eight years old, I developed what's called obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm. Um, and I remember being in a schoolyard and another student said to me, Simon, if you, if you lose, if you don't talk for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. Uh, and so this set me on a 30-year, um, I guess, love-hate relationship with OCD. Um, and and so I had developed this obsessive thought in my brain that if yeah, if I don't talk or or make a sound with my voice, my voice will be gone, and and it terrified me. And and so I started a compulsive behaviour or response to that, which was humming to myself for. Uh, for about the next one to two years, I would hum to myself all day long. Uh, but I'd do it ever so quietly that no one really heard it or nobody ever said that they heard me doing this. Nobody questioned me doing this, so I don't think anybody heard me doing this. Um, and, and yes, that's that stepped me into the, a world of mental illness for 30 years. So Very interesting. And like you said, and you notice now reflecting back that that seemed to be triggered at say eight years old where it came in. Uh, did you mm. notice that there was, apart from that person saying it, was there anything happening in your life at that point that sort of changed? No, I don't think so. No, not really. Like it was, we we're still in the same household. Things certainly changed and ramped up when I was in my early teenage years and mum and dad split up and, and myself and my little brother, we moved out with mum. Um, and that entered me into the darkest days of my life, really, like when depression really came in, um, generalised anxiety came in, but my OCD also ramped up through the roof to the point where, you know, I had you know, thoughts of suicide as well. Um, so, but, yeah, not so much at eight. Like it, it, we were still at home. Mum and dad fought a bit uh, around a business, so they had a business as well and they used to, f to fight a bit. And I remember just sitting in the back rooms listening to that and I hated hearing hearing them fight which was primarily just mum yelling at dad and dad would just close up shop basically wouldn't respond and, and I think that fueled mum a little bit further uh, but that's the only thing that I can think of from back then that might have triggered this type of response I really don't know it's it's hard to pinpoint what exactly caused me to 
to really believe what this kid said in the schoolyard. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think when we're so young, we're so absorbent to information. The littlest thing can change everything. Mm. That's why I feel it's so important that the littlest thing we do, the littlest act of kindness, the littlest act of compassion can actually be life changing for someone, even if Mm. it's small. It doesn't need to be the grandest gesture doesn't need to be the biggest event to make a difference to to someone or multiple people you know because each person goes on to affect everyone else and they go on to affect everyone else it was interesting yeah, definitely what came to mind for me then is when you're saying about your mother and father relationship and that your dad would close instead of reacting mm. and that made her react and it was just interesting that whether you were subconsciously aware at the time or maybe you're self-recognized like i don't want to be silent like him you know because often we look mm. at our parents and how they behave and we want to do the opposite (laughs) most of the time we look at them and go right that's how they do it i'm not doing that you know we know and 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 there's a there's a reason when i share my story that i talk about the 80s and 90s as well because it's like a land i say keep saying land i think because i watched the land before time the other day on tv (laughs) (laughs) it was a time before social media and a time Mm -hmm. before things like you know broadband internet or even internet really um phones were pretty much no one really walked around with a mobile phone and and, and so the world was, you know, it was a very testosterone and masculine world for me. It was the one that was around boys don't cry, boys need to bottle things up. And I, I think I saw my dad doing that when he was in these arguments with mum. And, and, and so I bottled it up too. You know, it took, me, it took me 20 years to actually start talking about mental illness. And it was not in my late 20s. Um, but in, in, when I was eight, I bottled it up. Like, I'm like, okay, to be a man is to bottle things up. We don't talk about mental health discussions weren't even happening in Northern suburbs of Adelaide in the eighties and nineties. Like didn't even, I don't even think it was in a dictionary <laughs> to be honest with you back then, like for where I grew up. And, and so, yeah, like I bottled it up, like I'm assuming dad did. And, and my brothers never talked about mental illness. We talked about physical, you know, pain and suffering because, you know, being sports, sports, Men, sportsmen we um would get hurt on the footy field um and we and you know if we pulled a hamstring or we we rolled an ankle or whatever we, the first thing we'd say is like we're gonna go see a doctor or a physio and get this fixed up um and so but not so much our mental health if you're if you're struggling inside it was one of those things like just suck it up you know get through it work it out and just move on because nobody wants to hear your your troubles inside and so that's the kind of mantra that I took on, like most guys growing up when I did, and, and around the world. You know, I'm having lots of these conversations with guys around the world, very similar. Like they grew up in a, in that period of time when it was boys don't cry, boys can't show emotion. And if you did, you were labelled as being feminine or you were labelled as being gay or anything like that. And it wasn't so much like, oh, you're just tuning into your more vulnerable side. It was like, no, you're anything but a man if you start crying or talking about your emotions and, and, and feelings and stuff like that. And it's interesting around that 10 years old point in time is I remember a mate of mine being in the schoolyard and, and, and he was crying in the schoolyard and I went into that automatic boys don't cry mode and went up to him and said, mate, you've got to stop crying. And he said, why? I was like, well, because boys don't cry. So here I am projecting this thing that I've been socially conditioned myself. And he, and he said to me, Simon, I can cry if I want to. And it was a really powerful moment for me because it planted a seed that I've held onto ever since. And it informs the work that I do now through Mindful Men and my, and my mental health business, um, that boys can cry and they should cry. And, you know, for, for anyone, myself included, to say to someone back when he was 10 years old that, you know, suck it up, boys don't cry. It was the wrong thing to do. And, and you know, you see it come out in so many different ways. Like, you know, if you just look at data, the statistics around men's mental health and, and men's well-being and men's lives, two come out, to, come to mind for me. So one is suicide data. So in Australia, it's like nine lives are lost every day to suicide and 75% of those are male. And then you look at the family and domestic violence data and men are overwhelmingly like the perpetrators of family and domestic violence. And what these two stats tell me is that we have not learned as guys how to process emotions and and feelings and stuff like that. And it's coming out in either rage or anger, um, you know, in in the case of abusing our families or, or, you know, kids or, or elders even, like elder abuse is a real thing. 
or it gets to a point where we just can't function anymore. We can't cope anymore. So suicide is unfortunately the only way out for a lot of these guys as well. Um, so tuning into our, our vulnerable side, and, and I'm, I'm glad my mate said that to me when he did, I just wish I did something with it earlier than, you know, 30 years later. So, Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And I think it's a much needed area like I too as a as a bloke as we would say but went through a lot of mental health issues myself depression suicide thoughts from like a real young child but my mum had mm. really severe mental illness she had the worst case of schizophrenia i've seen and i've been to many mental institutes hospitals or whatever someone wants to call them um throughout my life with her and she'd spend periods in the basically padded cells like in the worst case scenario mm. in them places and saw yeah. people with so much mental illness um, what was interesting now, as you say, when I look back, there was vastly more females in there than males. And I think that's because mm. people take notice of it, not because there wasn't men suffering. They're not being acknowledged it, because we can see now, like you said, the amount for depression, for suicide, how high these statistics are. Um, and I know as myself, I bottled it up pretty much my entire mm. life. And I justified it to myself that all this suffering, all this pain, this terrible feeling I have, anyone else would have it if they was in my shoes if they was in my position so i just accepted it and i was like when i fix everything it will go away yeah and mm. then life continued to get more chaotic you know and i had to fix it during that time I went through a whole trial of events and stuff but i got out of it yeah? and it was through lots of different methods but during chaos yeah i think that yeah started me sharing at the beginning of lockdown i saw them statistics just skyrocket Right at the beginning, mm. it was like the suicide for male, females, but especially males, all of it was rising and depression was rising. So I started sharing online what happened in my life, being extremely vulnerable and sharing all the depths and details that I never thought I'd even talk about, you know, just to shine a light mm. to people. And I noticed so many men, uh, they said, reach out and be like, see that it's okay to, you can either cry about it or you can talk about it, but it's not something to be ashamed of or feel guilty of. And also something that can yeah. change. You know, it's, and I remember like you were saying back, oh, when would it have been for me? Like through the nineties, when I was a little bit older and looking after my mum, I was always like, oh, if she had lost her legs, people would help. People would understand, you know, if, if she had a physical problem that was really obvious, people mm -hmm. would understand. But because it was a mental issue, even though her behavior was obvious, it wasn't normal. Um, people just wouldn't resonate with it they just didn't like yeah. almost accept that it was even happening and then they would go to all these different reasons why it's happening you know it wouldn't didn't i even knew as a child like that doesn't make sense how you're trying to work this out and this problem you know and you're not letting that person really even speak about what's wrong with them you know or yeah. how they feel yeah. it's like look you just got to sort yourself out you're not good enough you know mm. this isn't the correct yeah, and, behavior and, uh... <laughs> And it happens so much like, you know, when we live with mental illness, it's like we're, we're wearing a mask and like on the outside for, for a lot of people, you, you can't even notice it. Like you would never know that inside they're absolutely dying inside um, and they go about their day. They're successful. They, well, in, in some cases, they're successful. In other cases, they're not successful. Um, in some cases, there's a lot of misdiagnosis as well. So what could be presenting as as one particular illness is actually another illness and then you know, depending on that diagnosis can depend on the treatment, medications can also impact as well. And, and, and yeah, so there's, there's this whole, like, it's like a veil over mental illness where, and you're right, like if, if, if it was physical, it'd be a lot easier to work through and a lot easier to get help, but because it's invisible and for a lot of these people, they're just like you and me, like you would, you'd walk past them on the street and you would not know anything's wrong. But inside, they are like really hurting, and it's not until they come to a point where they can finally let it go, they can finally get that release somehow. They come to the realization that therapy might be worth worthwhile, or or that they harm themselves, and and then it just comes out naturally through that process. Or unfortunately, it's 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 the end end game where yeah, suicide might be the only option, and then all of a sudden people go, "I wish I saw the signs," or "I wish I said something sooner," or or, or things like that um yeah it's it's a real difficult space to be in both for the people who are experiencing it the people that are like the loved ones around it as well but also service providers who might be ininformed or ill-equipped uh you know i remember growing up and and basically in, in a school in a school situation 
if you saw a guy, a young boy in in a classroom acting up, it would pretty much they would just be labelled with ADHD, just like that. And they're like, oh, you know, you need to go to the principal's office, and and they and everyone will be like, oh, he's got ADHD or whatever. But in reality, it might have had things like autism or something like that, which we, you know, only just the last what what seems like to me the last 10 years that we're starting to understand autism and how it operates and and how it's different to ADHD and 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 so just there getting labeled with ADHD and then so it starts people thinking I've got ADHD maybe there's other people start comparing I've got ADHD and this is the 90s as well like you know there wasn't Google, you can just go to Google and Google your symptoms. You know, you had to rely on on hearsay in, hearsay in the schoolyard or actually going to get a diagnosis if you had the kind of family around you or the supports around you that would actually take you to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist or, or your GP. Um, so, yeah, it's a really challenging space to be in. But um, I'm glad you, you you started opening up about your story, mate, because it's, it's podcasts like these that help to normalise these discussions. Um, you know, we've only just met and we've already been going almost half an hour on, on a mental health discussion for men. Um, and, we, and we're showing that it is easy to talk about. You know, it's hard the first few times, but the more you talk about, it, the easier it gets. And I've had this conversation lots of times over my last 10 years, particularly. I'm sure you've, you've had lots of conversations too. I mean, I've, I've watched your podcast and I really enjoy how open it is and vulnerable it is. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing and, and holding this space with me so that we can show other blokes that it's okay to talk to. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And yeah, for me, like talking about it right at the beginning, I remember being in my sort of, or even in my teenage years, but specifically in my early twenties, I remember it still being really present. I couldn't say the words, my mum's ill. If mm. I had to, so no one really knew I hid everything as much as I could from friends, from family. And as I look back, it wasn't because I was a little bit was because I was ashamed of judgment but it was also because Mm. I wanted to not when I was with a friend or when I was away from that chaos I didn't want to talk about it because I didn't want to be back in it you know that was my Mm. escape I'm now talking to them about something totally different so I'm not thinking too much about what I'm about to go home to Um, Mm. but I remember even when I had a girlfriend and the first time I hid it from her for a couple of years before she even knew anything was wrong with my mum yeah, and I was like, then when I went to tell her, I was like, my mum's, uh, and then as soon as I said, tr- tried to get the words, I just broke down, you know, it was yeah. so hard. And then it, that made me more fearful to bring it up again or talk about it because I was embarrassed to cry because I was like, mm. I'm, I'm not strong enough. You know, and I grew up with these action stars and heroes that were really influential. And some of it was good because it made me want to be that hero. It's like, I can take on any situation, you know, I just got to toughen myself up. But in that process of toughening myself up, it was like you said, boys don't cry. That's not tough. You know, so it was Mm. like any moment them feelings came up. Like I don't, I'm trying to think now, I think I've seen every Arnold Schwarzenegger film. I don't think I've seen him cry. (laughs) I don't think there's a moment where he's got emotional in that sense. So like, it's like, you just don't do that. You know, that's something that isn't, isn't present, but it made me want to be that hero and, and be strong for my mother, be strong for my brother and, you know, take on the world to, be the best you can but it was done from what i call like an internal dictator who was like you don't cry you push through Mm. you have to do this you have to be better you're not good enough you know and it was constant just self-punishment for even doing a good job wasn't acceptable it had to be always better um and Mm. yeah when i started sharing like i'd gone through such a journey already that i could talk about it you know i talked with people about it and saw in real life that sharing my story from an empowering perspective and opening up, people came back to me and started saying like, oh, that's really motivating. I was like, I didn't know that about you. Oh, you know what? That's made me think about this different. It's made me have more. And I was like, really? I never thought my my drama in life, my trauma had any use. You know, I thought, oh, hi, that is useless. Yeah. And then when I saw that, I was like, do you know what? I'm going to share it online. It made sense. I was like, I'm going to share this with people. I'm just going to see if if I can encourage, motivate, inspire people that, you know, it's okay. You can transform. And like I said, with the characters, I like to see trauma as drama. And no good character mm-hmm. in any story isn't built into some way through drama. You know, we wouldn't watch any TV show or even a comedy if it didn't have an element of drama in it. But for so many people, that's something that's shameful, you know, because they didn't do a good enough job. I don't feel good enough. Yeah, and what I'm interested with you and, and your life, at what point did you come to the place where you're like, do you know what? I'm going to, this is my passion. This is my service. This is what I'm going to do. 
Yeah. So I remember being in, in like a lot of kids, like coming towards the end of high school and you start thinking about careers and and stuff like that. But I didn't really have a, a strong support network because, I mean, my parents didn't go to university or anything like that. And, and like I think one of my brothers went, but he only went for a little bit. And so we didn't really have this this lineage of people saying these are all the possibilities. And, and so the my idea of the world was, you know, the guys that dropped out of school and they became tradies and or they went into the manufacturing. We had like a a, um, a car manufacturing plant near us where they built Holden's cars. And and so a lot of people just ended up in those types of jobs. And I never really wanted to be in that. I was never that kind of guy. But I remember at one point reflecting on my depression, which I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know it was called depression at that time. Um, because as I said, like, yeah, we didn't talk about mental health, not even in schools, it wasn't part of the curriculum. And I said, I want to help people just like me that are going through whatever the the pain that they're going through. Um, I just want to help them get through that. Um, but I kind of went on a bit of a 15-year detour. So even though I had that goal in my mind, and and it was it was from that my friend as well, having that seed in my in my brain around boys can cry. I mean, I did start some psychology in, in uni. I got into uni and, and I did start one year of psychology and I got through it, but then the second year just became too hard and and I kind of dropped off. And I think probably I was a bit immature for university back then. Um, so I settled on a, like a, a generalist degree um, and ended up in a 15-year career in a public service, so doing a lot of government-style work. Um, but it never lit me up. It never fulfilled me. And I think probably around seven years into that career, I started thinking about, okay, what's next? You know, my brain starting to fade, um, wasn't really climbing the ladder like I thought I would. Um, the money was good. I mean, the money was really good. Um, but it, yeah, I just, I started to hate, hate things. My depression was coming back a bit or a fair bit. And so I started this process of thinking about what's next. And so 2018 came along and, and I finally got to that point where, like, I really need to change careers. I really need to do something different. And so I went to my local university and, and got talking to, to the career counsellors there. I've never seen a career counsellor in my life. And I said, you know, what options do I, do I have? And they introduced me to social work. And I really love the concept around social work because we can look at these big grand theories and how you know how things like capitalism influences us at a local level but also a global level um we can look at how we interact with each other from a from a child and a parent perspective as well um, that was really interesting but there was a whole lot of stuff in there about mental health and i'm like yeah okay cool and by this stage i'd been diagnosed so i actually was diagnosed and when i was 28 so i started at eight undiagnosed until 28 and but then it was probably around like yeah my mid 30s that i'm like okay let's use this I, I've, i'm now coming to terms with it i still hadn't told a lot of people about mental illness and, and stuff like that. this is only a relatively new thing for me um but i'm like okay let's use this as a bit of a superpower as a bit of fuel because i'm really passionate about mental health now i knew what it was it had a name i knew i had ocd i knew i had depression i knew i had anxiety and so I started this social work degree. So I, I kept my my nine to five job um, full time. I then studied part time at university, so masters of social work. And we had two kids in that period of time. So and they were both under three. And I think by the time twenty twenty hit and COVID came and and we got locked down for I think five to six months initially, um, I hit a burnout stage so i actually burnt out completely physically mentally emotionally spiritually every every single way possible i was like a potato <laughs> sorry potatoes if you're listening i'll just <laughs> put some shame on you but i was i was a spud and 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 as part of my recovery process uh similar to what you were describing before is i started to i started an instagram account for mindful men and, and started sharing what burnout is because i'd never heard about it before um and as part of that i started sharing the other parts of my mental illness as well so i started sharing about living with ocd and depression and anxiety and masculinity because you know i was introduced through social work these concepts around masculinity and patriarchy and, and all these types of things i'm like okay the things that i was told in the 80s and 90s 
they're starting to make sense. It's part of the generational, intergenerational ways of bringing up guys and, and all this type of stuff. So I can start seeing these grand theories come to life in my own my own situation. And so I started sharing that journey in 2020 when I was recovering from burnout. And similar to you, like I went back to work and I shared that story some more and did some presentations and then other people started saying, Simon, I'm feeling the same. I'm feeling similar. Like, didn't know this about you because you're the guy that just always achieves. You're the high achiever guy in the in the office or or whatever. And, and I'm like, you know what? There's an element of perfectionism that and wearing double masks that's hidden everything from everybody. And I'm so sick of holding it back and I'm just ready to re- release it to the world. And so it just it's lucky that that burnout period happened at a time when I had a gap in my study because I think if I didn't have a gap, I would have really struggled to finish. Um, but we had the gap and then I'm like, okay, I've got to really use this mental health stuff because the more I'm talking about it, more people are coming along for the ride, the more I feel good about it because I'm sharing knowledge about mental illness and man- and men's mental illness. Um, and, yeah, so we kind of got to a point at the end of last year where I finished the degree and I was still stuck in that job, but then I was like, okay, in the in the process of starting a business, I'm like, all right, I want to step out of that public service job because it didn't light me up for 15 years. It was good. The last four years have been good because I've been working in a really cool area um, in disability, um, but I really wanted to do my own thing, and so I set Mindful Men up as a business as well. So it's not just the Instagram; it became a business, and I dedicated a you know set up a dedicated men's mental health therapy business because. I wanted to live that life or that dream that I had when I was about 16 when I said I wanted to help other people like me and and now I'm in a space where I can do it. Um, I still live with mental illness, but I use it as a as a tool, like not to to show other guys that, oh, you know, my mental illness is better than yours. It's more to say I've walked in similar shoes. I know how, how it feels. I know how, how what it feels like to be in bed and not be able to get up. I know what it feels like to to want to kill yourself. I know what it feels like to to be so exhausted from wearing these double masks um, and hiding everything from the world. I just know what it feels like to bottle stuff up. And and so I just it's just through a process of being in the wrong career, wanting to waken my brain up and, and waken my life up again and, and then falling into finding social work and and just doing things gradually and and so we 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 achieved it we got the degree and it was tough on my family because i you know when i was meant to be dad to a, a one year old instead of doing that on the weekends i was in a library learning how to write university papers again and 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 you know doing research and all this type of stuff but you know we're out the other side now and and i've got the books are open and i've got clients calling me up and i've got guys getting therapy and it's just it's a wonderful feeling to live this dream that i Put on hold for 15 years um but at the same time like I, I wouldn't be here today if i didn't go through that journey as well probably wouldn't have met my wife and have my two beautiful kids and have our family as well so there is you know some some positive beams of light that come out of that journey um but like i like a lot of people i wish i, I jumped into that journey 15 years ago because i think i would be a lot further in my career as a mental health practitioner um than i would if i didn't do that path so yeah, no, it's interesting. And it's a great space that you've found yourself in. And I can hear the passion that, like you said, it's different to your passion for when you was working, mm. say the government, you now can wake up with, I bet there's nights where you can't sleep because you're waiting, you've got a call in the next morning and you're working with someone, even though they're in a terrible place, you're excited to be able to be there for them mm. and to just not only um, support them, but encourage them. It's a big element of what yeah. I do. And what I've noticed is encouragement is what's missing. There's some people are fortunate enough to have a support system, family and friends, but because it's hidden what they're going through, they can't be encouraged in their life because no mm. one knows what to encourage. And so even our passions and our desires and dreams or potential we don't really share that you know we think oh no i don't want to look like something i don't want to seem too big for my boots as someone would say or like there's their own self-doubts in their abilities they don't want to share in case someone critiques it Um, but when they open up to what would be a stranger that's in an encouraging space the things that they can say and share and you see the excitement and the passion within them light up and often people that are very depressed that's a big element i've noticed that they've never really opened up with their real desires and what I noticed mm. from my journey of sharing is lots of friends I've known from school for 20 years coming out and going, I didn't know that about you. I'm so sorry. I, I, I wish I knew. 
And I was like, don't be sorry. You know, I'm grateful for every experience I had. It's made me who I am now and that's all I can be. So I'm just going to be grateful for it. It feels better that way. And yeah, they, but they didn't know because like you, I just hid it. I didn't want to share it because I felt if I share my pain, maybe they would feel that pain and they would be in pain and their friend or family. I don't want them to be feeling it. You know, mm. and also I think it was you just don't want to even say out loud because it's painful. Or maybe you'll cry. Was there a moment in your life where you did say that sticks out that you did say cry, but it was comfortable? Like you felt like, do you know what? I can just let this flow. It's okay. Yeah. So I didn't really start doing that type of stuff in front of other people. Like I'd had to shed tears by myself in bed or whatever. Um, but I remember like, like my wife was the big driver for me to go and get help the first time. And that's 10 years ago. You know, I was, I was in a dark space. My OCD was through the roof, like going just crazy. Um, I was hurting our relationship and she said like, you know, you've got to go and get help. This is not healthy. What you're doing. I was drinking too much, you know, trying to numb the pain as well. Um, Self-medication just didn't work. And, and, I remember going in, like saying the words, I think I've got a mental health issue to my GP was really hard. Kind of like what you said before, like you choked on the words as they came out. But I never really had a crying moment in in therapy until the point that I had burnout. So when I was going through that burnout period, and this is what, 2020, so it was 10 years earlier that I got diagnosed and all that type of stuff. And that was more of a relief than it was a, a painful process. It was relief that, okay, what I've been going through for the last 20 odd years is has got a name and I know what it is now and I can get help now. But I remember the burnout thing because I think I was so just spent and I have got the family here and, and, you know, I wanted to be this, this high achiever that I, and part of the, a lot of the stuff of the OCD is, is high levels of perfectionism and having a bar that's set really high like a high level of standards for myself that I place on myself, but also a high level of standards that I place on other people. And and with burnout, I just couldn't even jump up to touch the bar anymore. I've been doing it for 15 years of my career, but I just couldn't get anywhere near it. And I remember being, I had to, I had to take my wife to therapy as well. I just was such in such a bad way that I remember just, no, not even before that, sorry, before that when I was talking to my boss and I said, I think I'm burnt out. I can't keep doing this. And I did. I'd I'd never shown this level of emotions to my boss. And this was on the phone. And I burst out crying. And and I remember calling my wife after that phone call. And I said, you've got to come home. And she's like, why? What's wrong? And I said, I've just been crying to my boss. And she's like, what's going on? You never do anything like that. And I I I don't know. I don't think I felt shame by this stage because i've been talking about my story with my other therapists for so long and with rachel my wife but to do it in a workplace situation was quite a little bit confronting and so i'm not sure what i felt like if it was shame or relief or like um just i was just probably relief actually but then it, it happened again not long after that and I, I remember going to the to the to my therapist my social work the the mental health social worker that i saw and just saying the words I'm burnt out because I and that just triggered me and I just and I had to take Rach to that session to talk about burnout and and yeah I just I think I cried for 20 minutes nonstop. I didn't say a word in this therapy session I was just crying and and that was just an overwhelming sense like a relief to just get it out there and say the words I'm burnt out you know um to another person who I've never met before, like to, you know, once before, but also to see Rachel see me in that space as well was a huge relieving thing as well because I could show her in this removed setting in therapy, like it wasn't in our household, it was in a in a third party area that, that I was really struggling to the point, like you know, I couldn't provide for my family, I couldn't provide for myself. I could barely even talk properly. Um, you know, I could barely think straight. You know, it was just, it was a, it was a weird time because I'd lived with mental illness for so long, and these moments of just getting it out there were just relieving and and 
just so emotional. Um, yeah, that one really sticks out is the burnout process. And I think because it's so recent as well, um, like 2020, and to the point where I think I was even close to it at the start of this year as well, trying to get this business up and running and move from that old job. And I remember being in a similar state of mind. Um, but it was so nice to just cry it out as well. Um, as part of this year, my recovery this year, I went back to psychology, you know, see a psychologist and work through that process again. But I um I thought I'd try breath work. I'd never done breath work before. And because when you're at that point, like in my life where I've done so many different types of therapies and talking only goes so far and medications only go so far, I, I'm, you know, I'm at the point where I'll try pretty much anything. And I was at that point this year. And I thought, I thought let's try breath work. Everyone's talking about breath work. The first time I did it, um, it was really um, like an overload of the senses. There was a lot of noise happening. There was I was with another in a room about twenty five people, and there was a lot of noise. I'm like, it triggered me. I nearly ran out the door. I was like, wow, this is just scary. Um, but I went back again. I, I forced myself to go back, and this the next time there was only about ten people there, and I thought, no, I'm going to give this a really red hot crack. And I got in this, this this weird zone. I don't know how to explain it. I'm, the, I'm not an expert on breath work, but I got into this zone where I just started crying and and it was so nice to do it in front of other people. Like I was, I was laying on my back and my eyes were closed and everyone was doing the same. But it was so nice just to do it in front of these complete strangers to release that, whatever was in there. And I just remember just crying for like probably half the session. Um and that was a nice release of 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 that raw emotion, because um, when we finished, I didn't feel like I was going to go home and you know cut my cut myself up or, or you know get more meds. I actually felt like oh let's do this again. I can't wait to come back to the next one. And and it was just a, a really powerful moment as well. So yeah, I guess two sides of that emotional coin. Yeah, no, it's fascinating that you got into the breath work because that's something I've been doing for a long time myself and I found just an amazing process to the point that I teach people mm. breath work as well. And some of the, I was doing, and it was really, uh, I was fortunate to have a beautiful setting to do it. We were doing breath work on a sandy beach first thing in the morning. There was about 20 of us. And a lot of the people that came, came for more for sort of the physical element to move their body, to to breathe and just be wake up. You know, they weren't there, say, for mental health. For me, it's mm -hmm. an holistic approach. It's about unifying the body and the mind in that moment. And breath work, I find, is a brilliant tool for that. And when I'm getting them, I'm watching them and seeing as we do certain exercises, as I affirm affirmate certain words to them at during the process and correct certain postures to their nervous system as they breathe, the, the eye is watering up. You know, and all they're doing is breathing. They're not thinking about anything necessarily, but different people are going through different experiences. But by the end of it, everyone was joyful not happy i would mm. call it joyful they felt just alive you know they, they, yeah. they were all talking to each other they all felt excited they all wanted to go do something you know they all had energy <laughs> and they all just felt great and for me it was just beautiful and i was like okay this is like it's so powerful so it's great that you're adding that in and i think it is a, a, a it's getting more and more attention but in the mental health space i still think it's very overlooked it's like seen as this mystical yogi type you know spiritual side of the things more so than it can help even simple mental health, but anxiety, depression, so many things it can bring the body back to a, a state of balance so that we mm. can recognize certain elements within ourselves, so that we can then work towards that and free ourselves. I, I had share your experience when um, I was just doing it on my own, this is breath work and sort of silence, like a meditation. I don't personally like to use the word meditation because I find it overused and everyone has a different definition. But I was, say, being still, being silent and just concentrating on my breath, trying not to think. And this was a few years back and the word excitement kept coming in. And I was just realizing, like, I haven't been excited for so many years that I've lost the sensation. I don't know what excitement is anymore. And in that moment, I was excited that I haven't been excited for the excitement that one day I'll be excited. And I got excited and I just started crying, but with a smile. And I'm just, I was just sitting there breathing, tears strolling down. I came back to my love, Danielle. And she's like, why are you been crying for? And I was like, I said, I just uh, feel like I've just felt excitement for the first time in like 20 years. I said, loads of stuff's mm. happened in my life. But that sensation was like reliving something that I'd been missing. Yet I wasn't technically doing anything exciting, someone would say. Do you know, I wasn't going to 
do a real exciting activity, but within that created that sensation. Um, but yeah, that crying for me, it was like not crying for so long that even when the most traumatic things were happening in my life, I, no tears were just, I, they were just blocked. It wasn't, I didn't even mm. have to hold them up, hold them back anymore. It was just like yeah. I was that cold that I don't cry anymore. But the byproduct of that is I also didn't cry when it was something joyful, something loving, something, there was no tears and them tears are beautiful tears. Now I can cry when mm. something's like, a nice feeling of tears you know where you are crying because someone's told you a story and you're just so moved in a beautiful way that tears start to stream and that yeah. was a beautiful experience when that first started to happen you know and then the thoughts come in your mind where it's like oh man people are missing out <laughs> you know there's like this is something and then you talk to people and they're like oh well no i don't cry my parents always told me when you cry i'll give you something to cry about <laughs> mm, you know, it's like yeah. oh don't cry don't cry and I think you going through your experience gives a, I know you said, I'm not sure if you said two boys or one boy, and that was definitely one, but they've got that advantage now where they've got the father figure who's going to be able to support them emotionally. You know, whereas yes. as you were seeing so many kids out there, it's not, a, they haven't got that. You know, even though mm. so much is available online, there's so much information that the chances of them coming across the information that's encouraging is still slim unless they've got a strong father role model which is i think our innate role model with our parents you know so when they're balanced the byproduct is the child's going to grow up with a bit more balance so i think they've got a strong yeah. advantage i want to know mm. with your wife a little bit about your love story how because how, she's been there through <laughs> tough times and i yeah. i lost my one through, through my depression and chronic fatigue she couldn't recognize it i couldn't recognize it um and we drifted apart and we got divorced and after 10 years because she couldn't looking back now she didn't know how to help what to do she didn't know to recommend therapy we were young we were in our early 20s um so that just didn't work out and that was just more pain on top of pain because it was the last thing i wanted but that's what happened so how, how did you meet your wife and what's your love yeah. story it's 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 one that i've reflected on recently i was on a podcast about love and i'm like i'm going to put myself out there and talk about my relationship with rach because because without her like i wouldn't have been on this journey for the last 10 years getting getting help um but i always take it back to like the the few relationships i had before that like there was always relationships that i had during high school end of high school and into my early adulthood years and and throughout my 20s where i was always like not fitting in with their their life i was always a little bit like okay Simon's not really fitting in neatly in our box we've got to try and stuff him in there and and, and change the way that he he is and and by but like in, in all due respect, like with that, I still wasn't diagnosed. And so my behaviors and the way I thought about the world and felt about the world was still uh, like I was still going through that internally. And so while they were trying to put me in a box, like I felt like I was trying to always come out of the box and, and find my own way and figure out what's going on. And those relationships never lasted. Like it was always like something was wrong with me. It was always my fault for something. And so those relationships there, yeah, they came and went and and I was devastated on each of them because I kind of always had this traditional mindset that you you get with, you start dating a girl and then that's it for the rest of your life. Like, I, And that happened to me when with my first serious girlfriend in year 12 and we broke up after a, bit, after a while and my life just completely went to shit, basically. Depression was huge. I didn't know what to do with myself. I dropped out of school. Luckily, I went back about six months later and finished and and it really sent me on this downward spiral. And, and I always tried to have relations, like try to be better the next relationship and do anything to please the person in order to keep the relationship alive. But over time, I got to a point where, um, you know, I was living away from home for the first time and I was living in Canberra. I finished my uni, uni degree and I moved across from Adelaide to Canberra, which is another state um, in the Australian Capital Territory. Um, and I spent the next year or so, I got into another relationship where the similar thing happened. And that one was an interesting one because even though I was outside of my home state and my hometown, I was actually dating a girl from my hometown, but she was from the well-to-do area. And I was from the wrong side of the tracks, essentially. And that kept coming up in the relationship. She's like, you know, I love you, Simon, but 
you know, my parents keep saying that your 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 parents separated when you were in your teens, so you're going to do the same. And and also, you will come from this kind of lower socioeconomic, you know, place, so you're never going to be rich and 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 all that type like real BS type stuff. And and so you know that that naturally ended. And and then I spent a bit of time just not part, well, probably partying, like. I got involved with a soccer club, you know, in the in the town, and started socialising, and it, and I felt really alive because it was the first time that I had a group of guys that I would see a couple times a week and have some fun with, and because um, it was kind of one of those, also one of those guys that in high school, and whenever I got a, a serious girlfriend, all my mates would just drop away, and I'd just involve myself a hundred percent in that relationship, um, like a lot of guys do, and and. And but I had this really fun period, and then I just happened to bump into an old friend of mine from school who who had moved across, and 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 there next to her was Rachel, and 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 you know we just had that fleeting moment of of g'day, and um, from there I kind of did some Facebook stalking and and got in touch with her, and um, yeah we connected that way, and then we we moved in pretty you know pretty quickly together, like everyone. Like Canberra is a very transient town. Like there's a lot of people from outside of town there that come to work in the public service. So it was normal for for like housemates and stuff like that was a normal thing. Um, and then yeah, like a couple of years later, she got you know we, we were still going strong and she got homesick, so we moved to to Tasmania. Um, she's from Hobart, and we we went down there for a while. And it was around it was there that I, I went through another bit of a depressive state and. And she really encouraged me to, to get to go see that GP. But I knew at that time that she wasn't trying to fit me into her box. It was more that she just saw the potential in me and she knew that I needed to jump out of my own box and really get some help and be the guy that she, you know, she knows that I can be. And so I had this gut feeling like, okay, Rachel's not trying to change me like those other relationships. She's actually trying to help me. Um and so yeah, we followed that path and I got the help and and it's been a roller coaster. Like I've I've had lots of down periods and there's times when Rachel goes, You're really hard to live with. Um, and I recognize that. Um, but she's always stood there, stood by me, you know, she stood by me while we've taken this huge financial hit for me to start this business, for example. And um, but she's there right with me, helping me live this dream. So like, yeah, I couldn't be here without her support and um, she's an amazing woman and very strong and she um she's the best mum as well to our little kids. So oh, nice. Nice. And I like that. And I can really resonate with a few things you said there, especially the being in the box and feeling like you've got to break out all the time and not wanting to be conformed to anything. Um, but also the same when I got into relationships when I was younger, it was always like, this is the one that's it for life. No matter what, that was my mm. goal and dream. I always loved the fact I was like, oh, I'd love to be a person one day where I was like, we've been together eight years, you know, and that would yeah. I wanted to always like perfect things and be perfect. And I like the idea of that. And when that doesn't happen, then I'm like, now, now it's only going to be 60 years. Oh, I can never, cause you can't undo it. You can't go back in time. So it's like, <laughs> if it doesn't work, it's like, you just lost everything, but you've also lost a future or you've lost your yeah. dreams and so many painful things. And when you're going through mental health issues, like I said, the a relationship just triggers them things. Cause that's something you're so intimately attached to. And when I look back, my hardest sort of thing, it, and it probably was coming from being cold and holding my emotions in to be strong for others, that I wasn't emotionally connected in the relationship. I wasn't giving my actual emotional self, you know, I was practical. I was always trying to be uh, providing in some way, but I was never providing emotions, you know, and mm. I think for a guy, I think that's a, a big thing that they don't realize is important because like you said, with brought up that emotions are female you know no no real man is emotional yet there's pleasant emotions too and if you close off like the tears you close off your negative emotions your your feeling down emotions you're going to start to close off your good emotions your joyful emotions all of the emotions are going to be blunt and who wants to be in a relationship mm. with someone with no emotions no male or female you wouldn't want to be with your wife if she just was cold she didn't show any love to the children she couldn't be emotional you know you'd be like well mm. there's no nothing to thrive on you know we thrive off each other's emotions we have celebrations to see the emotional change in people in that event you know, christmas comes it's coming in a few months and what parent doesn't want to see their child all excited full of emotions but pleasant ones you know yeah and definitely. the opposite they don't want to see them suffer they don't want to see the bad ones but we cut off all emotions 
you know it's it's not no way to to live mm. but no it's been fascinating to hear your story we're coming to the end of the podcast to try and keep them to about 45 minutes to an hour yeah so where where can people find i know you mentioned there's an instagram um mm. where, where's your business do you have a website where can people find and connect with you yeah so um my website is www.mindful-men.com.au um and it's a great space because it a it connects and anyone in australia who's looking to do some mental health therapy with me or disability capacity building work um they can see my services on the website but it also connects with my socials and my instagram and my facebook um, it connects with the Mindful Men podcast. So I've got my own podcast where I share my story and share the stories of people around the world, just like what we're doing now, um, and yeah, on access to LinkedIn as well. So, um, yeah, that's the best place to, to get me. And rather than me rattle off about 10 different versions of a link, <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely the best place to, 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 to see what I do. Yeah. Yeah, go there and then they can find out. Or whatever their preferred social platform is like you said there's so yeah. many these days so many places to share it's great that you <laughs> yes. great the opportunities there but it can be a bit overwhelming all at the same time um yeah, no, i'm yet to be on tiktok so maybe that's next i don't <laughs> I, 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 when i started sharing my journey like i, said, I started on youtube because i was familiar with that and i'd worked making videos for other people years ago so i was like i know youtube i'll put content out on there plenty of people go there I like the idea of picture and sound and it was like a challenge for myself as well because i was like not only talking about my life but to put myself on camera that was also forbidden most of my life i wouldn't yeah or well, wouldn't be any, there's hardly any pictures of me when i was younger because i hid from the camera because i didn't want to see this depressed miserable little kid and people say oh mm. smile for the camera and i was like i'm not gonna lie don't put me in your fake little box <laughs> you know it's like if you're gonna take my picture i'm gonna look how i feel and that's not good and i don't want to see that when i'm older you know, so there's little pictures of me but when it came to sharing on youtube it was like right, i'm gonna put my face out there i'm gonna put my voice out there and that will be not only a challenge but i could see the potential in the growth from that because i felt in a good place i felt in a safe place to do so it's not saying i'd say if you're really in a bad place to go out and just tell your life you know go through some work with someone one to one first feel confident feel good and maybe it will be part of a journey that you can share and express mm. um but no it's definitely uh like you said a, a, a great thing to be able to talk and, and share about it so but tiktok yeah. i did start that journey and it didn't last very long i found it so frustrating <laughs> You know, just the fact that when you log in, you get some terrible videos straight away in your face. And every time I went to log in, I was like, it's, it's just not my space. So I just, yeah, I, I just got off there. I tried it for a beginning because I wanted to be on every platform. But yeah, I'm not on there now. <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> YouTube, uh, my main place yeah. I concentrate on. You know, yeah, and I can same, same with me. Yeah. More quality um rather than quantity and spread myself too thin i found i was diluting myself and they said mm -hmm. when you've experienced that fatigue and the depression you're very heightened and aware of that burnout feeling that you're overdoing it to be like you said perfect to do the best yeah, yeah. job so you've got to be better and noticing them times and recalibrating yourself and knowing that's okay to step back sometimes <laughs> mm, definitely yeah particularly in this day and age of technology like i was feeling the same last week i dropped three episodes on my podcast and and it was mental health week here and i and i was just like simon you're a mental health advocate now your mental health is suffering you need to have some some tech free time so i spent yeah my weekend phone away as much as possible i had to do a little bit of work but um it was a nice feeling but just recognizing that and projecting that out in the world say so, hey it's okay we can turn off for a little while um recalibrate and, and focus in on the on the stuff that fills our cup and not dilutes us um that's okay as well so yeah good point to 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 in the social media space yeah nice i have just a few short sort of one answer you can go on longer if you want by ask the guests the same questions at the end do you have time for them yeah of course yeah if you had to choose one a cat or a dog dog what's your favorite color green what sound or noise do you love my daughter laughing. Nice. What sound or noise do you not love so much? My daughter screaming. <laughs> <laughs> what do you love about yourself? Um, the fact that I'm so open about my mental health, you know, it's something that I've hid for a long time, but I'm really, I really get a lot of joy in just sharing the story. Nice. And what do you love to see in other people? 
um, laughter and happiness because it, it rubs off on me as well when everyone else is laughing around me. It's, it's a nice feeling that peps me up too. Well, so last question. What do you love about animals? This can be pets or animals in the wild. Um, I'm really into birds at the moment. I've never really been into birds, but for some reason just watching them because we've got some a lake near us and, and just seeing the swans and, and the birds dipping and diving into the water, it's, it just makes me feel like just this sense of like stress or less stress and relief and just amazement and wonder about nature. It's something that's only just come to me recently and I'm still trying to grapple it and understand it and probably dissecting it too much. But, yeah, it's something that I've been really noticing lately is just the birds around us. Oh, nice. No, I absolutely love to watch birds and I can watch them for ages. And I think for me, what's so appealing, and this might resonate with why you, it's that box, it's that cage. When you see birds, they're, say, the least conformed or caged up animal when they're wild and they can just fly off. They can do what they want pretty much, mm. but they're so calm. But they've got that element of just freedom of they can move location any point they want. They're not fixed to that one spot. No, they obviously have their patterns in their life, but I think it represents such a freedom. I think that's what I find so attractive about just watching them there. It's a sense of freedom. Yeah, I really love how you said that. Yeah, because it's I've been thinking about like because I'm just petrified of heights and like like what do birds experience like fear of heights and <laughs> and chickens. yeah, it's a weird yeah just chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, like I, I love how you point that because it's probably like what I've been subconsciously thinking about birds recently. I don't, it's a weird thing. I've never thought about birds in my life, but lately, I think as I, I think because I'm spending a lot of time walking outside as a grounding technique. You know, being mindful about my five senses out in nature, and it's just just happened to be with. There's a lot of birds near us, so I love how you put that actually. Yeah, nice. Well, it's been beautiful to connect with you. I'm excited to share you with my audience and to put your message out there. I think what you're doing is uh, of a great need and necessity in this current time. Hopefully one day it'd be nice to say it's not, but right now it is. <laughs> yeah, Luke, I've really enjoyed our chat. Mate. It's, it's been nice just to, to hold space with each other and talk about men's mental health and, and our well-being. And, and I'll probably rattled off a, a little bit here and there, but you know that's just the nature of mental illness. You can kind of, once you start, it's hard to stop. So um, hopefully the audience got some good out of it as well and, and we inspired someone to, to go out there and, and start talking about their mental health. Yeah, and for me, like I said, part of this podcast, why it's called The Selfish Podcast, is I love to just connect with people one-to-one. So even if zero people less, listen, I got to, in this moment, listen to you, have an actual conversation with a, with a human, you know, in real time. So for me, it's always a beautiful experience because it's, like I said, it's that thing of sharing and opening up and reflecting on life and actually seeing the value in life even if it is Mm -hmm. being a bit chaotic or a bit painful at times you know so many of the guests have they can only really get to the point where they come on a podcast and share this sort of stuff if they've been through that process already so i haven't had a guest say come on who's in trauma who's not ready to share because it's not what they're looking for it's not no one's recommending i don't think just go on a podcast to get through your pain (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> not yet. Anyway, I've I've probably been half there in some of my podcasts that I've been on. But yeah, no, it's been it's been a really lovely lovely time with you today, mate. Um, well, I'm going to say goodbye. But if you can, I was going to. I always want to say hold on the line just for mm-hmm. final words when I say finish. But it's not a line these days, is it? Hold hold on to the the ether for a second, and I'll say goodbye to the audience. Thank you for watching. Truly appreciate you. I truly appreciate you for listening to the very end. So if you did, hit the like button, subscribe for more content just like this, and check out patreon.com forward slash Luke Greenheart on how you can support this broadcast, this mission, and my content creation. I am creating compassionate content to share, to love, and to shine. So come check it out.